Um, all right, so, um, yeah, I'm Tarlan Abele. Um, I am managing director of an agency called Drool. Uh, we call ourselves the Enterprise Experience Agency, but what that really means is we do an awful lot of headless. Um, we also own headless.com, and I'll tell you more about that a bit later. Uh, the general idea is we want to start building a platform to engender improved development resources, guides, and so on uh, for headless WordPress and other headless CMSs. Anyway, so uh, to start off, just so you know, um, I need the clicker. That's important. Did it click? It clicked. OK, so to start off, this is kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. I think just a brief overview of how headless has been seen. Um, I think you're probably all aware of that. It's a bit of a buzzword, but we'll get into that. Um, and then composability in headless and kind of how we see um, headless. And I think, I think that's sort of the direction it's going is more about composability than just headless as a technology. And then finally, uh, kind of how you can benefit from it um, in normal WordPress builds and then sort of going into uh, full WordPress, uh, headless WordPress builds rather. So just to start off, um, just so you know, I mean, you're all aware already, but headless has been done before out in the wild. Um, there's been TechCrunch, which was kind of earlier on. Ant, where are you? Hello. There we go. Well done, Ant, on TechCrunch. Um, and then there's the Times. Not sure what happened to the S. Um, but they've got a bit of a headless setup. If you want to talk to Ian about that, they've got some interesting stuff going on, which is maybe arguably more composable than headless. Uh, we built Android Authority and SoundGuys. And more recently, we've rebuilt WP Engine's website on headless WordPress. Um, and done some really interesting stuff. I'll show you a bit of that later on. Um, so to start off, let's talk about kind of what it's been understood as. I think headless is often talked about as just decoupled back end and front end, which obviously that's exactly what it is. Um, but I think that kind of where we're going with it now is more just this idea of composability overall. I think that as we go forward, actually, Tim mentioned this in the talk, that there is a bunch of benefits of having things distributed. So security could be one of those. But I think that it also allows you this flexibility as you kind of build out functionality to keep things siloed, keep things separate, um, and allow you more sort of room to grow features without building in high complexity into one place. Um, so is it just a buzzword? Kind of, it is. But I think it's more because of the way people tend to see headless and not so much because it's useless. I think it really has some value. That's kind of proven by the fact that enterprise rely on it quite heavily. Um, they rely on it, obviously, because they do things at a massive scale. They've got often a bunch of functionality, a bunch of integrations. Uh, the bigger the company, that list can grow into the hundreds. Um, and so inherently, things are headless. Things are composable, because you've got to integrate so many random different things. So I think that um, one thing that I will pull out now is that we sort of see it as a philosophy. And it kind of goes across three different things. So on the design side, I think that there's an opportunity to build composable from the ground up. So that means the classic design library type stuff. So, you know, uh, icons and then up from there into full components. So, you know, you've got that sort of atomic system of atoms, molecules, organisms, all the way up into larger components. So you all know what a design library is. And then sort of the same thing on the tech stack side. So we'll get into uh, <laughs> microservices and the Mac Alliance in a second, but it's that Mac Alliance thing of everything should integrate together. Um, and you should be able to use the best tool for the job in every situation. Um, and then finally, on the development side. So headless, obviously, you end up building things in React um, or Angular, but I think a lot of people are doing React. But in React, it sort of encourages you to modularize things and encourages you to break things out into components and separate functionality in diff into different sections. And you get that same composability thing mirrored at a sort of code level inside a lot of front-end JavaScript projects. So I think composability really should be seen as always try and silo out bits of functionality, design, or features uh, into separate sections. It also allows you more flexibility as you develop. Instead of developing into one massive code base, you can 
develop into a smaller one that's more purposeful um, and more focused on a specific feature. So, some quotes. <laughs> um, so I think that like, the, the general idea um, is that I think that business owners are seeing headless and, and composability as a way to mitigate risk. One of the other things that we don't really talk about with this stuff is that if you build something monolithic, you're investing all of your time, money, effort, and intelligence or like expertise or know-how into one massive thing. It's not a bad thing, and in some situations, well, in a lot of situations, that makes a ton of sense. It simplifies things, but I think that the way that people are using headless most successfully or using the idea of composability most successfully is when they're using it to accelerate their business and they're using it to sort of get a head start by going to a specific sort of vendor, let's say, or a specific you know, framework, so in the case of React, to get a head start in a way that makes a big difference for their business. So instead of trying to spend years getting a you know, single page application-like experience on WordPress, just build the React front end and sort of use the best bits of that particular framework. So the Mac Alliance has kind of done this all before. And so <laughs> kind of a lot of what I'm saying is a straight rip of what the Mac Alliance stands for. So microservices break everything out into sort of individual bits of functionality. API first, it should be able to be integrated into anything. Anything you build should be able to integrate into anything else you might want to build or use. Cloud native, I like this one because scalable and flexible and resilient servers in WordPress are tricky to get right. Um, in the React and sort of JavaScript world, it's a lot easier um, and more common. And then finally, headless. I don't think I need to explain that one. So yeah, once again, separate chunks of functionality as are reusable and distinct components and microservices. Um, basically, harping on that point of go to the best tool for the job uh, whenever you can. So um, let's show an example real quick. So this is what we do on the design system level. It's nothing special. Hopefully, all you guys are pretty familiar with Figma boards that look like this. Um, but I think the important thing to think of here is that this is, yes, this is the design side. But realistically, we mirror this all the way up to the top. Um, so, and that can, that can get into complex things, you know? Maybe you've got a uh, sort of meta navigation feature that is spanning across loads of sites. Ideally, you break that up into something that is very easy to implement and uh, transferable to any other sites you're working on and that sort of thing. And I think, that, um, <laughs> so this particular quote, I think, is a bit, like, clearly Mac Alliance is pushing for a specific uh, goal here. They are pushing for that Mac Alliance ideal of integrate everywhere and so on. And they are pushing for more people to come on board, but I think it still proves a point. We've obviously seen a, seen a lot of success with Mac Alliance, and I think it's generally where the industry is going. You're getting more and more I can't remember uh, <laughs> where I saw it on LinkedIn, probably. But I think the number of things that, that marketers have to integrate, and it's the same situation in publishing, same situation in e-commerce, the things that people are having to integrate is becoming a wider and wider array. And I think it's more and more important that as developers and agencies that we you know, sort of open ourselves up to that world. Because it seems to be the thing that's coming down the road. Um, Lots of people have a lot of success. And I think that there's a lot of uh, concern in the WordPress community because it's something quite new. I think the reality is, though, is that you can build headless quite successfully. And you don't necessarily need to lose out on all of the nice benefits of WordPress. So what that looks like is essentially, instead of having everything in WordPress, you start to look at a system like this. So if we're looking at marketing tools for site tracking, obviously you've got th things like analytics or mixed cloud or that sort of thing. You've got um, product information management systems. You've got campaign systems. You've got promotions and discounts and loyalties. So maybe you go for loyalty line for your loyalty program in, e in an e-commerce situation. For a UI framework, you might go for React. Or maybe you prefer Angular or Vue. For application, it's Next or Nuxt or something along those lines. For 
API, you can choose from REST API, you've got loads of options. And this is the cool thing, is that in amongst all of these, this is maybe just a small selection, for any one of these, these things, you can choose something that's big. Uh, <laughs> I saw that <laughs> there's a guy holding up a tent and it threw me. <laughs> um, so um, I was like, what am I supposed to do with a tent? Anyway, so <laughs> yeah, you've got options throughout all of these things. And that's a nice thing, is that when you come to building your specific uh, platform, let's say, and you've got a client who needs a really specific thing, instead of saying, can we find a you know, way to build this very specific functionality in WordPress, maybe you just go to a vendor or a SaaS platform or something that provides that thing in exactly the way that particular client or use case needs. And that's the, that's the nice thing about that flexibility. I'll also say that I think this is this is kind of the, the lifestyle of it, but there are those other things, once again, that security, um, like for example, security is a really important one, like spreading the uh, complexity across a range of services really does do wonders for security. You have to imagine that if you try building all of these things into WordPress, you're gonna get a lot of code complexity um, and feature complexity, and it's just, I mean, it's a lot of stuff in one thing. Um, in one monolithic thing. Obviously, yes, you can split things into plugins um, and uh, you don't have to build it all into core or a theme or anything like that. Um, but it's nice, uh, it's nice going to someone who's gonna do one of those things very well, i.e. loyalty line probably will do a better job of a loyalty system than you can build into WordPress or uh, WooCommerce, for example. Um, quick one. If anyone does get into Headless, just install Vanilla Extract. It's really good. It basically allows you to build a Tailwind type CSS framework, but built at compile time. This is kind of the nerdiest thing I've got in this uh, set of presentation slides, but it's really worth it and it completely changes the way you build the front end. All right. So when's Headless a bad idea? And I think uh, this is an important one because I can come off as a little bit too confident about headless when the reality is it doesn't work all the time. In fact, a lot of the time it doesn't work. So one, lacking the team expertise. That's not a jab at you guys for not being able to do it. That's just the way it works. Obviously, headless relies heavily on JavaScript and knowing that side of the world. If you don't have experience with building single page applications, it might be tricky getting into it. Um, it's also sometimes going to cost you significantly more. If you don't have the team or you've got to hire sort of externally to do it, it will cost you significantly more. I don't think that's a forever thing. I think once you get used to building it and you've got the team in-house, you can definitely manage it, but it can cost more. And then finally, adding unnecessary complexity. There's been a push in the last year or two, I think, or I'm hearing a lot of uh, SMBs shooting for headless. I don't know if headless makes sense in the SMB space all the time. I think there's use cases for sure. But I think generally speaking, what you want to look at is, am I going to give myself an unnecessary level of complexity to deal with even once the team's gotten up to speed? If you think that you're just adding complexity that's going to extend timelines 20% forever, just don't do it if you're not getting any benefits that sort of outweigh that additional uh, time cost. But I still want to have a piece of the pie. So firstly, you probably all heard of hybrid. Um, but essentially, there are things that you can do to get some of those benefits. If you want fancy animations and fancy UI, you can embed uh, React and all of the JavaScript frameworks into a site. Specialized roles, I think, is an important one. One of the things that Headless forces you to do is separate your back end and front end team. Um, and so that ends up meaning that you've got experienced, bless you, by the way, um, you've got experienced front end devs working on front end stuff, and you've got experienced back end devs working on back end devs. That classic thing of people uh, do stuff better when they enjoy what they're doing. I don't know how many devs we've got in the room, but you probably have a tendency towards back end or front end. So it's uh, nicer to work on, on what you like. And then finally, Gutenberg blocks is composability in a sort of UI system. Um, I think that uh, everyone's probably very aware of Gutenberg blocks these days, but I still do hear tales of people not building sites with them. Um, so 
get on it. <laughs> um, and then the good bits. Uh, this is, once again, the stuff that you know already. It's omnichannel. It gives you more sort of styling and front-end capabilities. It gives you access to things that are far more uh, sort of specialized for front-ends. I didn't uh, pause that time, but now I've just made <laughs> everyone aware of the fact that you just did it again. <laughs> and uh, native like UI UX. I think this is an important one. People have been talking for the last five years about uh, native like UI native like UI and UX on web applications leading to higher conversion rates and just sort of general stickiness with people. I think people feel a lot more comfortable in a native like UI. And then finally, localization, personalization, A-B testing. You can do all of that stuff without any performance issues. You can bundle it into your original request to the back end and uh, you won't see any sort of performance slowdown on the front end. So that's cool. Content editor experience is the next thing people tend to ask about. They're like, but WordPress is supposed to be easy and plug and play. And the good news is you can actually do it. Uh, you don't really uh, lose anything. It does take a bit of work, but you can get a pretty like-for-like -like situation where you get sort of full editing capabilities in Gutenberg blocks on the back end. And then obviously you've got your front end. Um, yeah, so I'll plug WP Engine. Um, so the... Uh, sort of upcoming look at headless. I think that here it starts to get a bit like, okay, am I, do I have a dog in this race or something? But um, the honest truth is, this is just sort of where it's going. Um, I think that there has obviously been a lot of hype around headless, but that is reflected by the fact that companies seem to be moving in that direction. I don't know how quickly it will get to the point where everything is that way or, or if we'll ever get to such a world, but it's definitely where it's going. Um, and of course. <laughs> so on to headless.com. So a lot of the things that I've talked about has just sort of been scratching the surface. Um, but we think that there's probably a better way to do it, which is build a platform that allows us to share information. And that's headless.com. So it will be a sort of platform agnostic and community agnostic, or rather agency agnostic thing, where we can essentially share resources, guides, documentation, and so on. And I'm going to have to rush, otherwise he's going to hold up another sign. Um, <laughs> all right, click is gone. Um, the roadmap, very quickly, is uh, firstly, just sort of get a base level there. Next, we want to start sort of building resources into a fuller capacity and get complete coverage over core integrations like Yoast and ACF and so on. And then eventually uh, we'll get around to doing a starting framework. And what you can contribute, you get to be a thought leader, give back to the community and collaborate with other experts. It's the classic WordPress community stuff that we all know and love. Um, and we're hoping that it can become a really good sort of knowledge resource for headless and essentially reduce the level of effort for developers to get into it and marketers to get into it and publishers and so on. Finally, a quick summary. Use specialized technologies. Use the best tool for the job. Why not? Don't limit yourselves. Um, modularize, modularize and reuse functionality. I think that's something you can apply to any situation. I mean, to be fair, the first one you can apply to any situation as well. Um, and finally, enable your devs to work with frameworks that are really targeted for the specific thing they're building. Um, once again, you know, JavaScript works really well on the front end. It runs great in browsers. So um, yeah, in whatever way you do it, whether it's hybrid or, or headless, get the most out of it. And once again, obviously, WordPress is a great back end. I think that about covers it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And questions? Yes. 10, 10 15 minutes. All right. You got any questions? Yep, go ahead. How do we uh, make sure WordPress is seen as a good sort of headless CMS? Because I think one challenge is clients have C stuff, mm. stuff. How does WordPress like? Yeah. Because, you know, for the CMS to maybe target themselves as like. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so as well. So the weird thing about WordPress and just headless CMSs in general is that if you use a headless CMS, there's a not there's not really a higher level of effort. It's just the way it works. So if you go to like Magnolia or Sanity or Contentful or any of them, you you, can't, you have to build a, an API still. It doesn't just do it all for you. It's kind of the same situation, and so really then the, the comparison becomes the content editor experience, which arguably I think we would all agree is better in WordPress. Um, and so in terms of convincing the client, I think it's, in my mind, I think it's more about giving them a general over -understand, overall understanding of what the situation is with headless. And then uh, I think WordPress and its content editor experience sort of speaks for itself, you know? Any questions? Yep. Mention like computer uh, bag blocks and then headless. Are there any kind of particular strategies or approaches you found that work well to kind of share code and that kind of thing? Yeah, so when we did the WP Engine site, what we really wanted to do was mirror. Um, our sort of like front end code on the back end. Um, but it was something that we ended up not doing because it did sort of reach a level of complexity that we weren't really happy with. That said, um, there is, there are, you know, it is at the end of the day similar styling. So you can share that code on initial build. And then as you make sort of feature updates to a block, let's say, it's a much smaller ask for a back end uh, back end developer to add those sort of slight design changes or something like that. The reality is, as you probably saw from that slide, I won't go back to it, but you know, the back end side is not one for one like the front end, but it gives a really close like 99% you know, representation. Um, yeah, so it's still a nice sort of editing experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you go for Would you say the developer experience is worse in headless in terms of like locally you've got more challenges to get us out of one of the I would say, uh, uh, so uh, it's kind of something I, I, I didn't want to get into because the kind of you need to really go into the setup to make it easier. But I, I put it like this: it, it's more a case of what you're used to. I think so. All uh, honest truth, basically, we started more as a headless agency than we did a WordPress agency. We're fairly young, and, and we started more with headless than we did WordPress. And I've got to say, at a sort of dev process level, I think we prefer working on headless than we do uh, just sort of monolithic. I think setup wise, you know, any most, you know, like uh, next apps or most front end apps have a fairly simple sort of dev and local development process where you can have a live preview. And then, you know, running the back end on local is the same process that you're used to, whether you're using local or Docker or some sort of custom uh, setup to, uh, to run it locally. So I don't think it adds a high level of complexity, but once again, you know, if you are able to separate out teams and have a front-end dev working on the front-end and a back-end dev working on the back-end, then hopefully you, uh, you shouldn't have to sort of set it all up on your own. Uh, go. Does that, uh, does that answer? I don't know if that does answer. No, no, <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go on. I'm going to try and frame this as a question, because I was so tempted to say it for a comment, but I'm going to make it... OK. <laughs> right. So uh, how do you feel, if you go to a really composable headless approach, how do you feel this should maybe adapt or evolve our attitude towards looking at the wider WordPress ecosystem? In particular context, I'm thinking here, is something like, Typically, if we're looking at e-commerce in the WordPress world, we'll go, mm. oh, we use Wix. Yeah. But once you start thinking, no, it's headless, I've got much more options for APIs and probability, I might look at, for the sake of argument, something like click commerce. What, what is the ecosystem we need to take account of if we think of WordPress as something in a headless world? Well, I think that's the cool part, actually, is it gets WordPress into that game. It gets WordPress into oh, it's actually one of the potential uh, vendors for CMSs in al alongside all of the other things that integrate into each other. So obviously, you mentioned Big Commerce, and Big Commerce is, of course, part of the Mac Alliance and part of that world of 
tech stack uh, that integrates to everything. And so that's, that is the fun thing. You're not talking about what's a WordPress plugin anymore. You're talking about what has a REST API. And a lot of bloody stuff has a REST API, basically. So you can kind of open up your horizons in terms of what possible. I think that's probably, was that the statement you were kind of turning into? Yeah, but it's like, it's like the challenge of it. Like, we're really comfortable being in this WordPress mm. world. So, so I th you, what is that bigger community? Yeah, so I think that that challenge of it is, I think that the, the, the break point, <laughs> this is a, such a touchy-feely thing to say, but I think the break point for when you should go headless is you'll feel it. <laughs> Like, it, it will reach a level of complexity, what you're trying to do, that you're like, oh, at this point, I should just do it headless, or I should do it composable, or I should do it REST API. I think there's a bunch of stuff, you, like probably the first 90% of stuff or 90% of websites that any of us are going to interact with really don't need that level of complexity. But there'll be something that you have to do that will be so tricky or so like the, the functionality you're looking for will be a, a level of complexity where you'll just be like, you know what, this, is, this could be headless. Because before that point, yeah, you can get away with a plugin or you can get away with a off the shelf solution. But yeah, there's a level of custom, I suppose, that you get into. It's very hard to define that on a, in a general way, but I think it's, it, it's going up into sort of the enterprise or you've just got a very large feature set or just like, uh, feature complexity. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, how many calls, uh, how many calls should you get? Uh, I know within the Sorry, say that again. Uh, how many calls should you get within your technical architecture? I know that you know some purists within the microservices space mm. you know, go right down. Mm. So everything is an actionable message and then you build it up from there as, yeah. as a basis. Is uh, it like you know, we talked about different degrees, I suppose, about where you mm. sit within that sort of micro scale. Yeah. Uh, what is, what is, is it still very practical or are you, are you looking for something? I think that's, an, that's that, so this is, look, this is the thing. These, these sorts of questions, I think, they're the things where, and I think with Headless, everyone wants to ask the question, like including us, of like, when's the right time to do this, do that. But that's a question that's really going to depend on the client and the budget because, uh, one client might have an appetite for spending a bit more in order to get a more focused end result. Focused as in focused on specifically the goals that they've got. Uh, whereas a smaller client, you know, maybe isn't willing to go to that level of complexity or sort of in-depth planning. Um, and it's just not going to make sense. But I think basically you should go... <laughs> You know, if you think of it as like one of those sort of tree diagrams where you've got one big thing at the top and then it sort of branches out, I think you keep branching until uh, you're getting to a point of, you know, it's too much for your team to manage, too many, you know, services involved to, to keep track of, um, or just diminishing returns for the complexity that you're adding in by uh, adding those services. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh my God, does that mean I can get off stage now? No, I'm joking. <laughs> Is that everything? Yeah, thank you awesome. so much. Awesome. All right.